tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Well, hey there, friend. Another day in paradise, eh? Another day, another dollar. But you're here now, and I'll tell you what. I'm just over the moon about it. Come on in, friend. God damn it, Chester, you hungry again? Well, forget it, kid. I don't have time for cooking. Grab a snack or something. These nice folks need their stories. Must be having a gross bird or something. Let's head on inside. Welcome to Casa de Blood. Mm. That's better. Vitamin T. Hey, remember Mario E. Martinez from episode 15? Well, those were so much fun, we drug him back kicking and screaming for another bloodletting. <sighs> Just kidding, friends. He was happy to join us. And he brought some crazy shit with him, so you'd better buckle up. All right, friends, let's smoke them if you got them and drink your glasses to the bottom. Because old Drew Blood has a tale to tell. But first, we're joined by my friend and fellow narrator, Paul J. McSorley, for a little corporate rigmarole. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcasts.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Thank you for your support. And we're back. God damn it. I'm recording in here. Get lost out there. It, it wasn't me. Damn it, Paul. Now, he usually doesn't sound like that. He must have had something stuck in his teeth. Hey! Hey, get! What? Oh. oh, my. Uh, Jeff, let's, uh, take that out and post, okay? <clears throat> Uh, anyway, you can hear Paul's excellent podcast, Fear from the Heartland, on this very network. Why don't you subscribe to Fear from the Heartland, wherever you listen to podcasts? You'll be happy you did. Hmm, I guess he was hungry. Scaly prick. And we're off. This one's a tale of art, obsession, and the true desires of the heart. It's a doozy. So, from author Mario E. Martinez, I give you grand electric gestures of love. Abel Verdusco had been in love with Cleo Riley since they were ten years old. She had come into his elementary school classroom and bewitched him with her red hair and blue eyes. Throughout the years, he had had to contend with these feelings daily since the town of Four Creeks didn't have more than 3,000 people in it. The constant desire to speak to her, to be near her, but unable to act on those desires made him nervous and shy. Most of Four Creeks took this as a sign he was strange. He watched her in high school, dating all the wrong kinds of boys and walking the halls without so much as glancing at Abel but he always carried a bit of hope that went deeper than the awkward silence and acne. The boys she went out with weren't serious, and, he thought, the town was so small, eventually Cleo would have to look at him in a new way. Abel clung to that hope until Cleo started going out with Ryan Wanmacher, a kid from San Casimiro, just 15 miles down the highway. With Ryan in the mix, Abel felt his hopes get torn to bits. He dropped out of school and soon after found a part-time job with the county in the dead animal cleanup department. Sure, he'd heard the whispers, the rumors. The town thought it was because he was quiet and weird and stupid. 
not fit to be around people. In reality, he took the job to get lost in something that wasn't Cleo O'Reilly. He saw her in just about anything and everything. But whenever Abel had to pick up half an armadillo, sunbaked to the density of a bowling ball, he didn't think of Cleo or her red hair or her blue eyes. It wasn't the ideal life, but Abel could at least say he had money in his pocket and a job to go to every week. The routine, though reaching a new level of grotesque with every outing, helped ease his loss of hope and for the department earned Abel's fierce loyalty. After a while, things were almost pleasant. Then in 1950, the men were called to Korea, and Abel, along with a few folk from Four Creeks, had to take a bus down to Puentes to get a physical and his assignment. The bus carrying Abel had stopped at neighboring towns like San Casimiro and Gaston as well. To Abel's dismay, Ryan Wanmacher was sitting in the front. Throughout the ride, Abel couldn't help but look up and see the smug shape of his head and inwardly snarl at how much it made him think of blue-eyed Cleo and her red hair all over Ryan. At the base in Puentes, Abel was examined and turned away. Though he'd been able to do all of the physical exercises and thought he did all right on the written exam, the draft officer found the smell coming off him so repulsive the man considered it his duty to declare Abel Verdusco unfit for service, sending him home with a document that said he had flat feet which rendered him unable to perform the duties of a member of the United States Army. Abel and a few others rode back to Four Creeks that evening. Out of the four others that weren't selected, two were so elated they couldn't help but laugh the entire time. Abel was quiet because he was ashamed. Truthfully, he didn't want to go to war with anyone. He had never heard much about the Koreans, and he was sure they were nice people, except for the ones they were fighting. But he had no desire to see their country or get shot in it. A part of him wanted to enjoy the feeling of relief, like the two laughing men. But another part, that until that day had lain dormant, told him that Ryan Wanmacher had gone to Puentes, had been looked at and examined same as him. Except the U.S. of A. wanted Ryan Wanmacher when they needed brave men to fight. Men like Ryan, men who could go out with a woman like Cleo Riley. Like Cleo, the draft had looked at Abel and thought he wasn't fit for service. By 1952, Abel had returned to his routine and the serenity it brought. The new highway to the Rio Grande Valley had opened, giving him a new stretch of road to clean. With it came more vitality to the town. A few new businesses, an extra filling station, and a few more families. That same year, Abel sat in the office across from Chuck Aaron, his boss. Abel was drinking his coffee while Chuck went over each of the country newspapers. For a while, the only sound in the office was the rustling of those pages. But then Chuck sucked his tongue and shook his head. Well, ain't that a shame, he said. Local kid, one mocker, uh, Ryan. Apparently he got killed over something called Hill 266. She yet, uh, can you imagine? Dying for something that doesn't even have a proper name. Let me see that, Abel said, taking the paper. Well, you know the guy? Kind of, sort of, Abel said, reading the obituary. It was a list of awards and was heavy with words like valor and brave and patriot. Ryan was to be buried in Arlington National Cemetery alongside other Texans that had given their lives to help those in a foreign land. Abel kept staring at it. One part of him thinking that all this did was exalt Ryan to the status of local legend. But another part of him kept whispering a single phrase, one that disgusted and excited him all at once. Cleo Riley was single. Any thought of capitalizing on that fact was quickly tossed aside when Cleo and the Wanmockers returned from the capital. Cleo covered herself in black and rarely left the house Ryan had built for them. 
usually a ray of light in the bleak town. Now she dressed for mourning, never smiling the way she used to. This went on until the first Four Creeks Winter Festival. The town managed to get a Ferris wheel and some local vendors to bake pies and sell tacos. Along with them came the carnival men and their pit show. They set up a large tent that for a nickel a person served as a looking ground of oddities. Among them was a man with teeth filed to points and tattoos from the top of his head down to his feet. Another was the fat lady, an enormous woman with ankles as thick as a cannon. Another still was the pinhead, a deformed thing who grunted at the crowds and occasionally bit the head off mice that had been provided in a bucket. Abel, like most of the county, had been there that first night, enjoying a break from monotonous small town life. Inside the pit show tent, he spotted Cleo O'Reilly among a group of girls they had gone to high school with. Two things about Cleo struck Abel as odd. The first was that she wore a blue brooch on her black dress, which he took as some cosmic sign that the shell of mourning Cleo had surrounded herself with was finally deteriorating. The second, and most profound, was that she was laughing. It was something she hid behind her gloved hand, but it was a genuine giggle, one that brought a smile with it. Still, none of those omens gave him the courage to go up to that same display she had stopped to see and exchange even the most innocent of pleasantries. She'd smell his true intentions, he thought. It would make her think he was somehow dirty. Instead, he waited in the crowd until she left whatever had gotten a giggle out of her. Want to see what it was, he made his way to it. Abel was surprised. It was a rack with shelves, each with its own specimen in a jar of embalming fluid. In front of them, a young carnival worker pointed at each and told their histories. A two-headed piglet from Southampton, a set of shrunken heads from Peru sat in an empty jar like cookies. The one getting the most attention was in a tank and took up a shelf all its own. It was a mermaid. According to the announcer, the thing had washed up on the shores of Greece and had been preserved for decades to be shown around the world. Abel shook his head. It wasn't anything more than a shaved monkey cut in half and stitched to the back end of a catfish. Abel scoffed, but the people around him stood in collective shock, and the air around him filled with whispers of astonishment. He couldn't believe it. His boss Chuck dabbled in taxidermy and went on about it whenever they got called to pick up any animal that wasn't soup splattered across the highway. Sometimes Chuck even brought some of his pieces to work. The man preferred smaller animals and liked to make them stand in ridiculous poses. Jackrabbits at a dinner table arguing over the bills, including a little beer can and tiny pink notices. Other times it was field mice jumping rope with grass snakes. He had even told Abel about the ways people used to make two-headed animals or little cryptids with hardly more than some sawdust, thread, and some animal parts. He had even said that was why they were usually kept in jars and shown in dimly lit tents so no one could see the stitching. People paying good money and squawking about something Chuck Aaron could do over a long weekend was ridiculous. But those things in the jars had somehow charmed Cleo. Then and there, Abel's mind compiled and cemented something that smelled and sounded like a plan. That she'd smile and blush and dance and wear so many colors, and she'd never forget it wasn't anyone but Abel Verdusco who did it for her. The project, the deadline, the thoughts of Cleo's happy expression at the sight of his finished work. All of it gave Abel an energy he hadn't felt in so long. It bordered on being a new experience. He woke up without the same aches and pains or the sour feeling in his stomach from the anxiety of a new day. That first morning after Cleo smiled at the fair, Abel went to work early. In the gray dawn, he took the county truck and cruised the highways looking for animals on the road. His project painted every mundane part of his day in new and wondrous ways. He was hoping for fresh kills, their blood still wet on the road. 
Not so when he scraped his shovel beneath them, the stink wouldn't be so bad. Instead, he wanted the freshest because they'd make the best materials. Those next months found him busy to the point of exhaustion. Mornings and evenings, he scanned the highways, pulling over to examine the roadkill before putting it in the truck. Abel knelt with a young spike whose back end had been smashed by a semi, holding the face in his hands to feel the bones beneath for any breaks. He massaged its ribs to see how far up the fractures went. Thinking at least the head was salvageable, he set to cutting it off with a shovel. The whole process, the setting of the shovel blade and the stomping through the muscle and bone, took a few minutes, which left him covered up to the thighs in clotted blood and gore. He placed the head delicately in a bag in the truck and threw the rest of the corpse in the bed. On the drive home, where he'd throw the bagged head in the icebox with some of his other materials, Abel's arms were heavy and trembled from the exertion of decapitation. He decided he needed more tools if he was going to make a proper oddity for Cleo. Before long, a big knife and machete rode along with him. During his work hours, Abel never let on that he had any designs to do anything but waste away at a cushy county job. Still, he didn't squander those eight hours a day. There was a project to complete. To pass the time, Abel asked Chuck questions about taxidermy. Normally, most people would have been suspicious of another asking them about such a morbid hobby, but Chuck seemed to genuinely enjoy the ancient practice. For weeks, it was a ritual. Over coffee and donuts, Chuck rambled on about the proper solutions for skin preservation, which brand of twine held the surest and the longest. The best way to slice quickest and how a rotten liver could make a bobcat mount stink for decades past the day it was stuffed. And as Chuck spoke, Abel took notes. He wanted to keep the project a secret. Somehow, he felt telling anyone would give Doubt a chance to seep in and mess up the works. Abel, despite his school records and profession, was not a fool. He knew that trying to get a woman like Cleo Riley to look at him like he was a man was frankly a long shot. It didn't matter if he had a million trinkets. Abel would always be Abel, and Cleo would always be in the pantheon above him. But in all the years he had yearned for her, the decade of masturbation to her and her alone, he had never had a better idea. So he jotted down his notes in the form of crossword puzzles that Abel filled in with taxidermy tips and methods. He'd just smile when Chuck called him an idiot for spending hours on the same crossword. Abel would fold the puzzle up, saying he'd work on it at home later. Abel suspected Chuck pictured him staring at a stupid puzzle that most of the biddies in town could complete in an afternoon. Abel didn't care, though. Let Chuck and the rest think he was just smelly, weird, and stupid. If they thought those things, sure, they'd spread their rumors. But they'd leave him alone. Leave him be with his freezer full of paws and torsos and heads, his tiny house filling with bones and twine and sawdust. The people outside weren't part of it. They weren't going to help. Only the parts would. When it was too dark to go out looking for fresh supplies, Abel sat at his small table and tried to sketch something that would be enough to not only get Cleo to smile, but would have her clapping and giggling every time she thought of it. Before too long, he found he was even less talented with a sketch pad than he was with wooing women. At the San Casimiro Library, he picked up books on art and drawing, and found a few on native animals of the area. Those he copied and traced until the most beautiful examples were decorating his walls. He found their sketched eyes unsettling. They watched him look over his inventory, praying that going over his materials again and again would give him inspiration. After a few weeks, he felt those penciled eyes were judging him. They reminded him that any idea he sketched would be too small, too insignificant to get the reaction he wanted. Even though some of his sketches made for stuffed creatures the size of feral hogs, most of them hardly rivaled the mermaid. No matter how he arranged the pieces in his mind, they were failures. The frustration bled into his work. The scrapes of the shovel were messier, 
and the hall into the pit was in silence. Yet the change in mood hardly seemed to register with Chuck. One day at the pit, a hole in the ground on the county line where they threw the animal pieces, Chuck, leaning against the truck with a beer in hand, rambled on about taxidermy. But, as you can imagine, people don't really look at taxidermy as a noble art anymore, Chuck said. Mm-hmm. Used to be that was the only way to see any animals from other places. Stories didn't work. Hell, you go to England. You've never been out of Texas, Abel said with a sigh. Don't have to leave Texas to read a book, Chuck said. But if you were to ever go there, you'd see carvings on the cathedrals. These scaly things with a mane. But the rest looks like a dragon, you know. And why? Because when they were told to carve a lion, they didn't know what the shit one looked like. Taxidermists were goddamn pioneers of information. Weren't you telling me they used to make up a ton of it? Abel climbed down from the back of the truck. Like that mermaid at the fair. That's what I'm saying, Chuck said, tipping his beer at Abel. Purveyors of knowledge painted as common and morbid twits, all because of a few sons of bitches. Worst of them was this guy, Gio Aldani, 1800s and shit. This guy used to bring the dead back to life. Mm-hmm. Stuck copper wires up dead animals' asses and, like, hang criminals and shit. Joke them and get them to dance. Used to tour all over Europe. He did what? Abel said, trailing off. The mention of electricity seemed to float just out of reach, whimsical and entrancing while being infinitely frustrating. Chuck scoffed. Huh. Not only that, they knighted the bastard for it. Can you believe it? Having to call that ghoul sir and bow and shit? All for what? Playing dolls with dead stuff. Abel didn't say anything. Hey, don't get me wrong. Amount is preservation, Chuck mused. A snapshot of life. But that shit? It's like going to a five-star steakhouse and playing with your food. Abel nodded, but was unaware of what Chuck had actually said. The pieces were falling into place. All they'd needed was a wire and a stage to dance. Once the weather cooled, Abel started calling in sick. Half days, full days. He went out in the mornings and evenings scanning the roads. But unlike the first months of covert scouting, where Abel felt as though he were just seeing what could be made out of what he found, now Abel was hunting for something. The design was in his mind, burning like an idol, and all he had to do was find the right materials. He had to buy another icebox on credit, which meant a strict diet of bologna and canned beans, but all the stomach cramps and stringy shits would be forgotten at the sight of Cleo Riley's smile. A month before the winter festival, luck fell on Abel. It took the form of a semi plowing into a bunch of cows that had broken away from the San Casimiro cattle auction a few miles down the highway. When they had gotten the call, Chuck and Abel had expected a mess, but found a scene like neither had ever seen in their professional careers. The truck had struck five cows, a pair directly, while only clipping the other three but the force was enough to pulverize them, scattering chunks and limbs all over the highway. A half a torso wedged in the tires, a cow's back end flung across the road and tangled on a barbed wire fence. Chuck and Abel worked all day inside of the highway travelers and the vultures, even ripped apart the pieces themselves were heavy and messy. Dragging the hind legs left a trail of guts and juices, and heft in the front quarter had the bones inside sliding out of the skin as if it were a sleeve. The heat and smell seemed to call every fly for a mile, and soon the men had to tie bandanas across their faces to keep from inhaling some of the living cloud. The flies followed them all the way to the pit, where they spread out to the other bones and rot, mingling with the fat blue bottles congregating there. Chuck threw the pieces in a hurry, griping that it was evening already, and overtime wasn't enough to keep him away from his recliner and beer. Abel, too, acted drained. His choosing of the pieces and chunks was careful, and each time he tossed them, it was near the lip of the pit. 
Looks like today's got you too, Chuck said once they were in the truck. At least it's over. Sure is, Abel said, though he was hardly paying attention. He was envisioning the legs of a good cowhide and the sturdy hooves that would serve as a nice base. It was all coming together, and it was going to be beautiful. The air finally turned cold and November came to a close. The nights froze and the days were blanketed by an iron gray sky. The festival was only three weeks away, so Abel called Chuck and told him he needed to take time off. Whatever his vacation days couldn't cover, Abel told him to dock his sick days too. When Chuck pressed him for a reason, Abel said he needed time. Time? Time for what? Chuck asked that morning. Gestures of love, Abel told him and hung up. Usually, he'd have been a bit apprehensive about calling in like that, but it was all coming together. For the first time, Abel Verdusco had felt the hand of fate and was convinced he was taking part in his destiny. He had been born into a little nothing town like Four Creeks so he could meet Cleo Riley and never have her. Up to that point, Abel thought it was some cosmic joke, but realized now it had been for the best. If he had had her in his youth, he would have been shy and awkward. His pimples or his smell or gangly frame would have made him a passing phase for her. Even when she went with Wanmacher, Abel still wasn't ready. Didn't understand the commitment it would take to get a woman like Cleo Riley. On top of that was the highway itself. There was no randomness to the festival, to the cabinets of curiosities, not even to Ryan Wanmacher's death. The universe had done it all, gave him his job, Chuck's knowledge, and the tools to use it. It had sent those cows running right into that semi, even made some old European revive corpses a century ago. The universe made a trillion things happen so Abel could do what he had been put on the earth to do. That first morning of his self-inflicted exile, Abel turned off the heat and opened all the windows until the entire place was the dry 40 degrees of the outside. He dressed against it, thermals and sweaters and a thick coat, and then brought out all the things he'd need. Abel set them anywhere there was space to accommodate the spools, the thread and coils of wire, and the collection of carcass parts. He stood among them for over an hour, never touching, only looking. Though he had sketched his creation out, figured where the wires needed to connect for it to really move, Abel didn't look at them again. In his mind's eye, the pieces arranged themselves before him, the parts rolling over the table and stacking on top of one another, the wires snaking into the frozen meat and bones while the needle and thread danced over the seams like a busy bee. It was all there, looming in front of him. All he needed to do was make it. For all the books he'd read, Abel found he wasn't very good with the needle, nor did the cold help his hand's dexterity. The skins didn't obey the same way they had in the books and manuals. Chuck described a process that was quite simple given the knowledge and dedication, yet for Abel, it nearly drove him mad. While he made his creation, he slept only a few hours at a time. He ate enough to avoid starvation, or whenever his body was so weak his hand shook. Withering beneath his clothes, Abel worked tirelessly, tinkering and perfecting. The only thing to keep him company was the radio, which only served to remind him that the Winter Festival was coming. And for a while, those were the stories of his days. Toil, sleep, toil. Life by the jingles for the festival. For Cleo's heart. Three days before the festival, as the trucks rolled in and the tents went up, Abel came out of his trance and was confronted with what days before had been a vision and was now a reality standing before him, motionless without electric life. Abel looked upon his creation and wept. The turnout was larger than expected. People from all over the county and as far as Puentes came into town to either buy or sell, clogging up the fairgrounds. 
Abel had begged a friend on the planning committee to give him a spot inside the pit show. After reminding his old classmate that he had never told anyone what he had seen conspire between his classmate and another altar boy 20 years before, Abel secured a spot in the back corner of the pit show tent. The morning of the festival, Abel went in to set up his work and to see the competition. Another troop came in, boasting a bearded woman and two aborigines who didn't look too awe-inspiring before the crowds arrived. The bearded woman did laundry, while the aborigines read a single copy of Dostoevsky. The least impressive was the Cabinet of Curiosities, a two-faced cat, a hand with seven fingers, a frog with the fangs of a dog. Abel smiled. Next to them, his creation would be like the breath of God. Yet, to his dismay, once the people arrived, they fawned over the smelly jars and obvious needlework. He'd built a little stage for his creation so it could be better viewed, and to hide the wires that ran up its back like ivies. Behind it, Abel set his switches and record player. His creation needed music to dance, otherwise it would just be dead animal parts jerking around on the stage. It would be beautiful, and it would get Cleo to smile those black clothes right into a trash can. She'd see what he was capable of and would cherish him as he'd cherished her. By the time Cleo showed up at the festival, Abel had kept the curtain he had strung up closed for so long his fingers were cramped. For hours, curious children and couples hovered just outside the curtain, pulling at it or trying to peek beneath. All they found was Abel hissing them away. He'd spotted Cleo in the middle of a gaggle of former classmates. She wore a dark gray dressing coat. As if the gray, so much more inviting than black, weren't enough reason to get excited, she wore a bright red brooch the shape of a cardinal. Abel bit down on his lip at the sight of it. He knew what that color meant. He waited for her to get closer to the curiosities before he opened the curtains to his hastily erected stage. At first, people could only see the general shape of it. The mystery drew them in, including Cleo and her friends, to see what new attraction the fair offered. Abel turned on his record player, and the gentle notes of a guitar broke through the whispers and drunken barks. Bing Crosby crooned. Abel hit the lights. They gasped. Of course they would, Abel knew. It was the first time he figured that some of them had ever seen something made with pure love and devotion. But they had only seen the shape. The form. He connected the cable to a car battery. The stage light surged. Bing skipped. And then the creation was dancing for the crowd. For Cleo. Its legs, which curtsied up and down like pistons, were composed of deer legs covered with bobcat fur and turkey feathers. They were sewn onto the upper half of a pig's torso, which wore a vest of skunk and possum skins buttoned shut with bird legs painted the color of Cleo's eyes. Each arm was a pair of cow legs positioned so that every jolt of electricity brought the hooves together like clapping cymbals. You'll never know how many dreams I dreamed about you Or just how empty they all seemed without you The face was that of a javelina stretched over a horse skull and set to look like it smiled with a mouthful of flat cow teeth. What the javelina skin couldn't cover, Abel had filled in with jackrabbit ears and vulture feathers. To make it all come together, he had set an old stovetop hat on its head, which he had had to tack on since it fell off every time the thing danced. Once it got moving, Abel's creation silenced the crowd. With a sort of hypnotic reverence, they watched it bob and sway, clapping a set of broken hooves together like a fool at play. Abel left the battery and snuck around the stage to watch their reactions, one especially. 
The angst and aches drained away once he saw her face, her eyes wide and beautiful, lips open just a little in awe of what was meant for her and her alone. He couldn't enjoy the moment long. Bing's voice slowed to a palsied pace. He looked in time to see some of the lights burst in a shower of sparks. One of the legs glowed red before a tongue of flame erupted from his creation's thigh, catching some of the pelt vest too. Abel took the coat off his shoulders and ran to his construction. He swatted at the fire until it was only embers. It sent out the thick smoke that had most of the crowd scattering. Through it all, the creation danced its few lumbering steps, grinning and watching the crowd with marble eyes. Once Abel got the fire out, he turned to face the people gathered there. Of all that had seen the curtain open, all but one backed away from the stage, clutching their noses and coughing. Cleo Riley stood apart from the crowd. She stared at the dancing figure, as if entranced by it and its song. Abel took a step toward her, imagining all the things he would say, fantasizing about how she'd be amazed at his dedication, embarrassed at the thought of him loving her for years, and touched by his grand electric gesture of love. The closer he got to her, the less he could trace any of the grief that he had seen in her for over a year. It's all for you, he wanted to say and she would listen. She'd think it was sweet and would fall into his arms in front of the whole county, even in front of the remaining one mockers and all the people who thought he was a nobody. She'd fall into his arms and tell him he was her man. Within a few steps of Cleo Riley, Abel Verdusco opened his arms to accept her embrace, and she violently vomited onto his boots. <laughs> and that was Grand Electric Gestures of Love by Mario E. Martinez. A good reminder to always follow your heart. Might not always turn out the way you expected it to, but... Okay, so maybe don't always follow your heart. But let's be reasonable here. Our next story is in the second person perspective. That means your ass is about to have an interesting day at the office. Again, from author Mario E. Martinez, I give you the light at the end of the hall. You like the office now. Ever since Gina left you, work has been a sanctuary. Yeah, a little hiding place. The coffee mug wasn't a gift from your grandmother. The bathroom didn't smell like potpourri and fruit-infused shampoo. It's just you, a desk, your research, and the halls. It is the first day of the winter break. Three uninterrupted weeks where the campus is deserted except for a skeleton crew of maintenance workers and administrators way off on the northern edge of the campus. Yeah. Walking into your building, a bag of groceries in one hand and a messenger bag hanging from your shoulder, you're relieved to find it empty. The back entrance, which opens directly to a stairwell and hall, is dark until you take a step inside. The motion sensors pick up your movements and turn on the lights. They flicker and hum, but eventually stay bright. Upstairs, the hall is dark until you walk into it. Like the first floor, sensors caught your movement and light your way. The hall is long, most of the wooden doors windowless with notes from desperate students taped to them. Your office in the main suite isn't far into it, which you like. The entirety of your happiness begins at the back entrance, inhabits your empty office, and ends with the communal bathrooms only a few yards away. You've learned from experience that before long, the lights at the end of the hall would sense no movement and turn off, leaving only half the hallway lit. 
At first, you found it unsettling, but it grew on you, let you focus on what you needed to do. The door to the office suite is thankfully locked. Inside, the cold tingles on your cheeks and you smile a little bit because it means no one is there. You take the groceries, some convenient store ham, cheese, mayo, and a loaf of bread, and go to the break room. You place the groceries next to the quart of milk already in there and make coffee. Mmm, normally you don't drink the crystallized stuff, but you're more a French roast than coffee by the tub, as Gina used to say. She loved your taste in coffee, and when she left, the smell of gourmet coffee sent you on a binge of self-loathing that almost got you fired. While the coffee maker drips, you close your eyes and take in big sniffs of coffee, and you're not exactly happy that you don't feel queasy at the smell. It's more like satisfaction that you survived for another day. The coffee is bitter, and from the smell, the remainder of the milk went bad. The sugar doesn't help, but you drink it anyway. At your desk, you slip off your shoes and work in your socks. The research you're doing is half-hearted and overcomplicated, but you do it because it forces you to read a bunch of books written by a man who only wrote novels through the perspectives of asexual trees, and not once has it mentioned lovers or wives or anything that reminds you of Gina or the divorce. The few pages you've written are shit and you know it. There wouldn't be a committee in North America that would publish it, even with your semi-famous name. Still, the man was prolific and time-consuming. You drink your coffee and read. You turn on the computer and open a blank document meant for entries about the man's novel, A Birch at the Edge of the World. But it's still blank even after three hours. Mm, the urge to piss gets you out of your cubicle and out into the hall. Except for the lights in the front of your suite and the bathroom nearby, the hall's dark once more. Before you cross the hall, you look into the dark until you can somewhat make out the shapes of the doors. For a second, knowing you're alone, you want to scream. Not words, but just let all the pleas and curses and whimpers all compress into one giant bark that you'll vomit out into the dark. Yeah. Instead, you go into the bathroom and piss sitting down, turning the blue water a sickly yellow-green. You sit there longer than you have to and the motion-triggered lights turn off after a while. You sigh, pull up your pants and step out of the stall. The lights come back on and you're confronted with your own face in the mirror. It makes you wonder where all the years went and then you remember that Gina took them along with the cat, which you didn't like anyway. You were a young man when you met her and spent the better part of a decade courting her and now she was gone. The fuzzy water is cold and it snaps you out of your momentary trance. You dry your hands with the hand dryer on the wall. The noise and the warmth feel good against your skin. Even when your hands are dry, you hit the button once more and cup your hands as if you were trying to catch the air. You go back out into the hall, the heat slowly fading from your hands. And something at the end of the hall catches your eye. The light at the end of the hall is on. Between you and it is at least 20 yards of darkness. At first, you think that one of the maintenance crew went into the storage room there and used the stairwell on the other side of the building. The door to the supply room has no window, so there will be no way to see anyone in there. But you stand there and wait for something to happen. You step back a little and open the bathroom door putting yourself inside a bit. You figure that catching someone as they walk out of a bathroom is preferable to catching a lone professor standing in the hall waiting for you. As it is, you know the office rumor mill is in full swing. Ever since the months leading to your divorce, you've caught your colleagues whispering that you aren't well, that the stress has made you subpar. Hmm. 
You don't realize how long you fixated on the idea of your colleagues, and the light at the end of the hall goes out, resting until it senses some movement. You step out into the hall and let the door ease shut behind you. You wonder what a maintenance worker could be doing in a cramped closet for so long and so quietly. Usually the radios on their belts clicked and scratched endlessly. The fact that there was no light visible from under the door strikes you as odd and somehow unnerving. Something had to trigger the light, but there would be no real way to trigger it and only it without more lights being turned on. Hmm. Thinking of this makes you feel uneasy. The dark and the door hidden in it. You've seen it before on nights where you stay so late the only one goes around are policemen and the glowing lights of the library, which is open all night. Once on your way to class, you even saw what was inside the closet. A spare push cart, shelves of toilet paper and cleaners, and a plain cement floor with a drain in the center. You picture those things as though cataloging their commonness will make you feel better. But if anything, it makes you fixate on the drain. <laughs> In your mind, it grows from the size of a CD to the size of a manhole cover, and then to the size of one of those cartoon bank vaults, with doors that roll open or closed. The holes, too. They get bigger until not only drops of liquid could go through it, but a man. You get closer to the drain in your head, but the dark there is too thick to see through. You peek further and still see nothing but the dark, except you get the sudden feeling that you're not alone in that drain pipe. Yeah, there isn't a sound, not a whisper nor a breath, but you know that something is there. As quickly as you left it, you're back in the hall, standing in the only patch of light. You haven't moved, but your body feels like it's walked a very long way. You decide that all of it, the feeling and fatigue, could be banished with a sandwich. At your office door, you give the dark hall one last look before going and making yourself a plain ham sandwich. You've had so many of them now that they don't taste like nothing anymore. This doesn't bother you. The alternative is ordering from all the places Gina liked. She was a lousy cook and so are you. Sitting alone in the break room, you eat because your body doesn't want to die. That's all. By the time you get back to your desk, it's past two, but it's all kinds of meaningless. With the office empty, you'll stay well past ten and drive home to shower and sleep. Lately, you haven't even turned on the lights when you get there. You navigate by memory. Memory of the way it was before Gina took the love seat and bar stools. Yay. You shower in the dark until the hot water turns cold. And even then you stay in it so long you tremble all night. At least the office has books, which you've read or authored. And solitaire, which you are terrible at now. Still, after the books make your eyes hurt, and you broke down and cracked the window to smoke. You play solitaire over and over again. The losses mean very little to you. You expect them, and the victories, though seldom, mean more to you than you think they should. In the middle of one such moment, the cards bouncing all over the screen with blasts of confetti and fireworks, you cry. You don't try to reason with it, you just cry. Once you're sufficiently tired, fortified for that long night ahead only by another ham sandwich, you save your work and turn off your computer. You collect your things and go to the door. Handle in hand, you hesitate for a second, thinking about the light at the end of the hall. But you tell yourself it's just a faulty bulb. You open the door and the light is off. This makes you smile. Looking at it as proof that all those weird feelings were nothing but nerves from the divorce. Yeah, all those thoughts of the drain and what was in it were nothing but the aches of a brain under too much stress. 
You look at the doc and want to laugh at yourself. And you would if you didn't find the whole thing sad. Then something moves within it, or so you think. The sight or thought of it gives you pause, and for a long time, you're searching the dark for some proof of anything. Any explanation. The dark gives you nothing. A part of you fears that. Another tells you to step forward. But the second part sounds like Gina when she was in one of her moods. It's telling you that a real man would step right to it without hesitation. A real man wouldn't even think to be afraid of nothing. It takes you a second. But you do. The first few steps have you in the semi-darkness. But with the next, the automatic lights go on. You illuminate the next two segments evenly. Not boldly, but without stopping. The end of the hall is becoming clearer. The door frame a little more visible. It unnerves you that you can't see more of it. Like the dark around it is made of thicker stuff than what occupied the rest of the hall. Hmm. The thought gets so big that you can't move anymore. You don't want to get closer, but you want to know, need to know. You fish a nickel out of your pocket and toss it at the end of the hall, hoping it'll be enough to trigger the lights. The sound the heavy coin makes in the hall shocks you, but the senses picked it up and the fluorescent lights click on. At the end of the hall, there is a door with no window, and the words maintenance, employees only, stenciled onto it. Seeing it makes you breathe easier. It makes turning your back to it bearable, though when you do, you still feel a little nervous doing so. That unease follows you down the stairs and into your car, leaving only when the radio comes on, and it's Gina's favorite song. In the morning, you wake up tired from bouts of vivid dreams. Their strangeness follows you all morning. You felt in your dreams that you were awake. Your sheets and shorts were not there, but there was nothing to see. All there was was a bubble of darkness all around you. Hmm. You couldn't move. It felt, you recall, like you were not alone. As if something inside the dark were looking at you sizing you up. Before long, you knew somehow that the other thing in the dark was responsible for it all. The paralysis. The blindness. It senses your knowledge and gets closer, moving through the impenetrable dark as though it were water. You know it is only inches away, and then a sound filled your mind. A clicky hum of fluorescence. In that instant, you are both comforted and horrified that a light is going to turn on. You woke up never knowing what it was, but you feel it somehow in all the shadows of the house, in the dark spots of the city on the way to the office. With that feeling so intense, you park your car a block away so you don't have to brave the parking garage. At the stairwell door, you find you're the only one there again the fluorescence clicking on just for you. The sound triggers something in you, the same dread as the dream, and it makes you jump a little. That embarrasses you, and you walk the rest of the way in shame. Somehow, the stairs feel like they're longer. On the second floor, the hall is dark until you enter, and as they do every morning, the lights rush on in a wave of illumination. Hmm... But this time, the light at the end of the hall stays off. This stops you. And for a second, you think of the dream and the drain. And it strikes you that maybe the light stayed off. Because something wanted it to. You stare at it until you get the idea that the dark is looking right back at you. You lock the office door behind you and turn on all the lights banishing any shadows there. It gives you a small sense of ease, enough at least to make coffee and dry toast. It's not long before the tingles of fear come back. At your desk, thoroughly making notations in cadence of cedars, it strikes you that there are no windows on the door, 
and that the hall is carpeted. Momentarily, you're not sure what these facts mean, except that you think the meanings spell some sort of danger. Slowly, you understand that anyone or anything could walk up and down the hall unheard. For all you know, whatever thing hounding you from all the dark places was right outside the door, waiting. The thought pulls you from your desk and takes you to the door. You get down on all fours, nearly putting your cheek on the carpet and try to look under the door. There's nothing there that you can see, but the thought won't leave you. There is something out there, and you know it. The rest of the day, you're a prisoner in your office suite. At first, you stop drinking coffee so you wouldn't need to urinate, which only makes the urge come rushing in harder. You try to fight it, hoping to wheel it away. Survival trumps the body's baser needs. You break down finally and piss in the break room sink with the water running. The act partially disgusts you and yet still fills you with a sense of pride at your decisiveness. A single sandwich is all you allow yourself since there was no place in the office to defecate. By eight, you've peed in the sink three times and feel lightheaded from hunger. There is a small leather couch beside the department chair's door. You lie on it as best you can to close your eyes a moment and conserve energy. Thankfully, the couch is too uncomfortable to sleep deeply and the dreams won't be able to find you, not like last night. After a few minutes, you aren't awake anymore. You're hovering in the haze between sleep and consciousness. In that state, you fixed your restless mind focused on the office doorknob. The layout of the suite affords you a view of it, and from behind your fluttering eyelids, you can't help but stare at it, half expecting it to move. You try to rouse yourself awake when that fear wells up, but once you see that it's still, your eyes close and all you think in that millisecond before temporary oblivion is, what if it turns now? And your eyes shoot open again, repeating the cycle for hours. You get up feeling like hell. Your lower back is tight and your intestines feel like they've been tied into a slipknot. You blink the fog of sleep away and stand, the motion nearly knocking you back on your seat. You walk up to the break room enough to look out the window. It's dark. The lamppost bright. You find the clock and see that it's well past two in the morning. Still groggy, the shock of the time makes you want to collect your things and go home. You push the feet in the side and sit down again. There is something outside the door waiting for you. The thought keeps repeating itself until you get hungry again. You make and eat your sandwich mechanically. You wash it down with tap water. Even in the break room, you stare at the wall as though you can see through it to the office door. You keep your eyes trained that way as you walk out of the break room. By force of habit, you turn off the lights but quickly turn them on again. You don't want the dark anywhere in the suite. It makes you feel better that the dark had been banished from the suite. You don't get far before you think about all the empty offices. Sure, you work in a cubicle, but there are six office doors locked and windowless, all of them enriched by the dark. Your mind fills with images of the pregnant dark behind those doors and wonder about this shadow feeling that's nagged you all day. You consider the idea that the shadow could move through the dark, the same as you would a door, which terrifies you, but explains how it could be everywhere. But a second thought, a worse one, washes over you and leaves you stunned. What if there's more than one shadow, you ask? What if the dark spots are like snake holes to each a creature, an entity, all of them different in temperament and proportion, united only in their want of you? That thought has its way with the sweet, 
the reassuring silence turning ominous and foreboding. Yeah, you backpedal. Eyes trained on the doors, more specifically their knobs. Groping with clammy hands, you find the break room and slip into it. Your panic doubles when you find nothing there to help you. The knives are all for butter, and there's not a fork to be found. At last, you settle on your director's coffee mug, a big pretentious cup covered in Rembrandt's The Night's Watch in miniature. Satisfied, you grasp the handle and smash it in the sink. The crash reminds you of how silent the building is. Now your fist is clasping only a handle and the sharp remains of the cup. You touch the broken edges with your finger, testing its sharpness. At first, it doesn't satisfy you at all until you slice your finger open. The pain comes and goes in a flash and your finger is in your mouth. You walk out into the suite arm cocked and ready to punch. You see and hear nothing. It fills you with the dread and drenches you in sweat. You keep expecting the doors to open and to unleash whatever shadow is hidden there. The strategy, you think, is to find the door that would open and be there ready. But then you think, perhaps they're all working in concert. That one door will prompt another and another. Mm. that if you were to strike at one, three more would descend upon you. Slowly, you back away from the main space, inching toward the door. Your eyes move from one door to the next with such haste you feel dizzy. As you touch the doorknob, you clench your fist together around the broken cup and turn around. You know something is out there, waiting. It wants you to come out and meet it. For a long time, you do nothing. You turn the knob, expecting something to rush in at the sound of the turning and unlocking. You open the door fast and punch out with a broken cup. Your eyes are closed, but you still expect to feel an impact, except all you hit is air. Thrown off balance, you open your eyes to regain your feet and see that there's nothing in the hall but you. The quick motion spooked the lights back on, but as before, the last light remained off. The sight nearly drives you back into the office, but something stops you. A voice. Not one around you, but from within. Yeah, it's Gina's voice. A sentence she uttered a few years into her marriage. She'd been talking to her cousin, unaware you were home, and said, No, he doesn't hit me or treat me bad. It's just, he's a pussy. The memory enrages you. That day, you'd gone back to the front door and opened and closed it loudly. That day, she'd been right. Now she was wrong. Broken cup in hand, you marched down the hall, telling yourself not to look, not to think about all the other doors or all the shadows. You stay focused on the end of the hall and the dark there. The closer you come to it, the more you wait for some shape to materialize, some creature to form. But all there is is a plain door that reads maintenance, employees only. Testing it, you put your fist and cup into the dark and find only air no different than the other end of the hall. You move your arm back and forth slowly. The light flashes on, sending you back a step. All the lights are on, and you are alone. But you don't feel at ease. Not yet. The door is solid, and the dark drain sits inside it. Hands still bleeding, you reach out for the door handle and touch it. The fact that it feels solid and cold does nothing to calm you. Lifting your cup, you grab the knob and find it unlocked. You close your eyes against a rush of images, crude nightmares dancing in your skull, and swing the door open, not knowing what stands there waiting for you and from where it came. You find inside that room 
that all was as you imagined it to be. <laughs> Your screen cuts through the empty building where it dies alone. And that was The Light at the End of the Hall by Mario E. Martinez. A good reminder that we're never all that far from the brink, friends. Just take yourself a personal day once in a while. That's all I'm saying. A little about the author. Mario E. Martinez is a writer from South Texas, giggity. He's written two short story collections, San Casimiro, Texas, and A Pig Named Orinius and Other Strange Tales, and A Pig Named Orinius and Other Strange Tales. He has a horror novel, Ash Tree, and is featured in the anthology series, Roadkill, Texas Horror by Texas Writers, Volume 2, 5, and 6, among others. He's got a wild new book out called Neo Laredo, which I hope you'll pick up. Cora Camino and his friends just want to tag the infamous wall, the one King Gringo built along the border, but instead they're kidnapped and forced to help a bunch of Americanos escape Neo Laredo. It's an easy job, unless the murderous gangsters, vicious metameros, or team of psychic super soldiers get them first. You can find Mr. Martinez on Facebook at Mario E. Martinez or Mario E. Martinez dash author. His Twitter is at Mario Martinez 39. His Instagram is at Mario E. Martinez Jr. And his website is www.MarioEMartinez.com. New feature, friends. Remember this address. gbooks.biz that's the letter G-B-O-O-K-S dot B-I-Z. Every week, Jeff's going to link it to whoever our featured author is, so it'll be easy to find them. Just bookmark gbooks.biz, and you can always keep an eye on what's going on. Hey, do me a favor, would you? Subscribe to this podcast wherever you do your listening, and leave me a five-star review and maybe a kind word there, even if you're listening on YouTube. I need soldiers on all fronts to win this battle, and I appreciate it. To hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of your screen. You'll find yourself at chillintalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. Thank you for your time and for supporting our sponsors. When you support our sponsors, you support this show. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all our latest updates and new releases, and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Stop on by, would you? I don't bite much. Well, I'm afraid this is where we part ways, friend. At least till next week. If you find any dog collars out there, just kind of toss them into the brush, will you? I'd like to recognize a couple more fans of the show. Shannon Schaefer and Troy Wood. Let me just say I've always appreciated your comments and support. Thank you. So, without further ado... Shannon Schaefer and Troy Wood. May the wind always be at your back, and may the road rise up to meet you. Keep your ear to the ground and your nose to the grindstone. And until we meet again, go fuck yourselves. <laughs> Good night, y'all.